What is up, my freshmen? Welcome back to the second part of today's lesson. We're on day eight once again, as we um, start reading through our next short story called Born Worker. Um, something to note here is that I have changed our agenda a little bit since our last video. Um, Mrs. Ton graciously pointed out to me that um, the assignment that we had originally created uh, to track the characters of the story didn't look right in uh, OneDrive assignments. It, it kind of messed up our formatting. So instead of playing around with that and trying to force it to work, what we've done is we've wrapped those questions up inside of our quiz at the end of the week. Our quiz might be just a hair longer than I had planned for it to be, but everything will be all right. I'll make sure that as I teach Born Worker this week, then I make sure you guys are ready to discuss characterization as well. In our next lesson, we're gonna finish Born Worker. It's a bit of a longer story, so my goal is to get through about half of it today. Um, and then I will give you an open note quiz that you'll have a couple of days to take at your own pace. That quiz is going to cover our 10 vocabulary words, so I'll try to point those out as we read today too. Again, characterization, we're especially looking at two characters from Born Worker. And then some ACT style grammar questions, I'll make sure that we cover those as well in our next lesson. So let's get right to it. We're going to open up Born Worker here. Day 8, Born Worker Part 1. Please watch this video, you're doing that right now. We'll read about the first half of Born Worker by Gary Soto. I have included the text right here. If you click on the PDF, you'll download it. If you click view, it'll open it up in a new tab, which is what I'm about to do here. Please remember to keep a special focus on the story's characters. I'll try to point out as many details as I can as we're reading, but I want you to, to be able to label those characters um, once we get to our quiz at the end of this week. Actually, one thing that I realized we should probably look at are characterization terms again. I'm going to go there, and I'll just cut the video uh, to, to get to that point, and then we'll cut back to Born Worker. Give me a moment here. All right, I found our story elements PowerPoint back from our day three um, lesson agen agenda there. I have uploaded that video to YouTube, so if you wanted to review all short story elements, you absolutely could there. But I just want to reteach a couple of the characterization terms here. These are the big things that we're going to be able to see inside of Born Worker. Um, and it is a coincidence that for this presentation I taught using Coco and Born Worker also comes from the Latin American perspective. Just a coincidence, I didn't plan it that way, but sometimes things work out that way. First term that we learned was protagonist, so the central character or leading figure in a story could be considered the, the hero of the story, but oftentimes has serious flaws like Miguel from Coco. I hope you guys can spot the protagonist of the story rather quickly. The antagonist is a character, group of characters, or concept which stands against the protagonist. I will suggest to you that in Born Worker, we do also have a clear antagonist, a clear character who is against our protagonist, or at least working against our protagonist. A couple more terms just as a review. Dynamic versus static. Dynamic characters are major characters who face conflict and are changed by it. Or, and is changed by it, singular character there. So be on the lookout for a major dynamic character and born worker. Static characters are characters who, whoops, sorry, Hector. Static characters are characters in a story who do not undergo any important changes or growth, like Ernesto de la Cruz. I'll suggest to you that we've got a static character or two inside of um, born worker as well. The last two characterization terms that we really want to look for big time in Born Worker are round and flat. Round characters are well developed. They do show a variety of character traits. Flat characters are almost always static. I think 99% of the time uh, flat characters are also static or only described by a few character traits. So if there's a character who's kind of one dimensional, doesn't have a whole lot of defining traits, that is a flat character. So be on the lookout for those things. Protagonist, antagonist. Dynamic versus static, round versus flat, as we read Born Worker here. Now I'll go back to that story. Let's do it. And here we go. You're probably noticing here that Born Worker, or at least the copy of the story that I found online, is one that is copied from a textbook. So we're going to be ignoring a lot of these questions and those kinds of things. Although this one's interesting. How do the boys' different character traits and motivations create conflict in the story? Again, we're looking for characterization big time as we read this story. Um, you can read the background if you like and look at vocab if you like. I generally chose vocab terms from this story that are not the ones that they suggested. So um, there are six of our vocab words inside of this story. I'll try to point them out as we read. But the goal is to read about half of this today and save the second half for our next lesson. 
And once again, they give you space to talk about characterization here, because this story is so, so good for discussing character. Let's do it. They said that Jose was born with a ring of dirt around his neck, with grime under his fingernails and skin calloused from the grainy twist of a shovel. Even in that first line of exposition, we get a couple of vocab words, right? Grime, so we have dirt and other substances stuck under his fingernails. Notice that grime is a noun here. And skin calloused, made hard, um, from the grainy twist of a shovel. A lot of you use callous as a noun on your, um, on your vocab practice, which is totally fine. Just know that on your quiz, you'll see it used something like this, where it's used as an adjective to describe someone's skin or, an, or a different body part. They said his palms were already rough by the time he was three, and soon after he learned his primary colors, his squint was the squint of an aged laborer. They said he was a born worker. There's the title of our story right there, and a character trait for Jose. By seven, he was drinking coffee slowly, his mouth pursed the way his mother sipped. He wore jeans, a shirt with sleeves rolled to his elbows. His eye could measure a length of board, and his knees genuflected over flower beds and leafy gutters. A little vocab point right here, notice that little number one by genuflected, that's telling you that there's a footnote to look at here. So this story does have a little bit more advanced vocab, but they also give us some hints on how to understand them. So if I check my footnote, genuflected, to kneel respectfully as in church. So imagine kneeling in a church pew, that's what genuflected means right here. They said lots of things about Jose, but almost nothing of his parents. His mother stitched at a machine all day, and his father, with a steady job at the telephone company, climbed splintered, sun-sucked poles, fixed wires, and looked around the city at tree level. So we get a little bit about Jose's family, right? They're working class. Mom sews all day, so she, so she must uh, maybe make or repair or sell clothing. Probably maybe all three of those things. Dad works for the telephone company, and he climbs up the telephone poles to fix the wires and to repair things. What do you see up there? Jose at once asked his father. Work, he answered. I see years of work, mijo. If we check our footnote, mijo is the Spanish phrase for mijo, which means my son. Jose took this as a truth, and though he did well in school, he felt destined to labor. His arms would pump, his legs would bend, his arms would carry a world of earth. He believed in hard work, believed that his strength was as ancient as a rock's. Life is hard, his father repeated, from the time Jose could first make out the meaning of words, until he was stroking his fingers against the grain of his sandpaper beard. His mother was an example to Jose. She would raise her hands, showing her fingers pierced from the sewing machines. She bled on her machine, bled because there was money to make, a child to raise, a roof to stay under. Scrolling down a little bit. One day, when Jose re returned home from junior high, his cousin Arnie was sitting on the lawn sucking on a stalk of grass. Jose knew that grass didn't come from his lawn. His was cut and pampered, clean. Jose! Arnie shouted as he took off the earphones of his CD Walkman. Hi, Arnie, Jose said without much enthusiasm. He didn't like his cousin. He thought he was lazy and worse, spoiled by the trappings of being middle class. His parents had good jobs and offices and showered him with clothes, shoes, CDs, vacations, almost anything he wanted. Arnie's family had never climbed a telephone pole to size up the future. I'm going to stop us there for a little bit, so notice the contrast between Jose and his cousin Arnie, right? Jose's family is working class. Arnie's family, as they mentioned here, are middle class. Mom and dad have office jobs, and they just give Arnie whatever he wants, right? Clothes, shoes, CDs, vacations. Something to note just regarding CDs. I feel old saying this, um, but setting-wise, this probably places our story in the 1990s. Maybe the, maybe the mid to late 80s, but definitely at some point close to the 1990s in here. Again, that's just like it was with Thank You, Ma'am. We have details in this story that, that give us hints about the setting. We're probably looking in the, in the mid to late 80s, maybe early to mid 1990s here, um, since Arnie has a CD Walkman to play his music for him. Let's keep going. Arnie rose to his feet, and Jose saw that his cousin was wearing a new pair of high tops. He didn't say anything. Got an idea, Arnie said cheerfully. Something that'll make us money. Jose looked at his cousin, not a muscle of curiosity twitching in his face. Still, 
Arnie explained that since he himself was so clever with words, and his best cousin in the whole world was good at working with his hands, that maybe they might start a company. What would you do? Jose asked. Me? He said brightly. Shoot, I'll round up all kinds of jobs for you. You won't have to do anything. He stopped, and then started again, except, you know, do the work. Get out of here, Jose said. Don't be that way, Arnie begged. Let me tell you how it works. The boys went inside the house, and while Jose stripped off his school clothes and put on his jeans and a t-shirt, Arnie told him that they could be rich. You ever hear of this guy named Bechtel? Arnie asked. Jose shook his head. Man, he started just like us, Arnie said. He started digging ditches and stuff, and the next thing you knew, he was sitting by his own swimming pool. You want to sit by your own pool, don't you? Arnie smiled, waiting for Jose to speak up. Never heard of this guy Bechtel, Jose said after he rolled on two huge socks, worn at the heels. He opened up his chest of drawers and brought out a, pa a packet of Kleenex. Arnie looked at the Kleenex. Hey, how come you don't use your sleeve? Arnie joked. Jose thought for a moment and said, I'm not like you. He smiled at his retort. That's another great spot to, to stop right there. Notice a little the little clue that we're given in the text right there. Jose thought for a moment and said, I'm not like you. Again, notice the contrast between these two boys. That's going to be super important as the story goes on. Listen, I'll find the work and then we can split it 50-50. Jose knew 50-50 was a bad deal. How about 60-40, Arnie suggested, when he could see that Jose wasn't going for it. I know a lot of people from my dad's job. They're waiting for us. Jose sat on the edge of his bed and started to lace up his boots. He knew that there were agencies that would find you work. Agencies that took a portion of your pay. They're cheats, he thought. People who sit in air-conditioned offices while others work. You really know a lot of people? Jose asked. Boatloads, Arnie said. My dad works, this, works with this millionaire, Honest, who cooks a steak for his dog every day. He's a liar, Jose thought. No matter how he tried, he couldn't picture a dog grubbing on a steak. The world was too poor for that kind of silliness. Listen, I'll go 80-20, Jose said. Aw oh, man, Arnie whined. That ain't fair. Jose laughed. I mean, half the work is finding the jobs, Arnie explained. His palms up as he begged Jose to be reasonable. Jose knew this was true. He had had to go door to door, and he disliked asking for work. He assumed that it should automatically be his, since he was a good worker, honest and always on time. Where did you get this idea anyhow? Jose asked. I got a business mind, Arnie said proudly. Just like that Bechtel guy, Jose retorted. That's right. Jose agreed to a 70-30 split, with the condition that Arnie had to help out. Arnie hollered, arguing that some people were meant to work, and others to come up with brilliant ideas. He was one of the latter. Still, he agreed after Jose said it was that or nothing. In the next two weeks, Arnie found an array of jobs. Jose peeled off shingles from a rickety garage roof, carried rocks down a path to where a pond would go, and spray-painted lawn furniture. And while Arnie accompanied him, most of the time he did nothing. He did help occasionally. He did shake the cans of spray paint and kick aside debris, vocab word, kick aside debris, so that Jose didn't trip while going down the path carrying the rocks. He did stack the piles of shingles, but almost cried when a nail bit his thumb. But mostly, he told Jose what he had missed or where the work could be improved. Jose was bothered because he and his work had never been criticized before. But soon, Jose learned to ignore his cousin, ignore his comments about his spray painting, or about the way he lugged rocks, two in each arm. He didn't say anything either when they got paid, and Arnie rubbed his hands like a fly, muttering, It's payday. I hope you guys are getting kind of annoyed with Arnie by now. That's intentional. Then Arnie found a job scrubbing a drained swimming pool. The two boys met early at Jose's house. Arnie brought his bike. Jose's own bike had a flat that grinned like a, cr like a clown's face. I'll pedal, Jose suggested, when Arnie said that he didn't have much leg strength. With Arnie on the handlebars, Jose tore off, his pedaling so strong that tears of fear formed in Arnie's eyes. Slow down, Arnie cried. Jose ignored him, and within minutes they were riding the bike up a, up a gravel driveway. Arnie hopped off at first chance. 
You're scary, Arnie said, picking a gnat from his eye. Jose chuckled. When Arnie knocked on the door, an old man in, an old man still in pajamas appeared in the window. He motioned for the boys to come around to the back. Let me do all the talking, Arnie suggested to his cousin. He knows my dad real good. They're like this. He pressed two fingers together. Jose didn't bother to say okay. He walked the bike into the backyard, which was lush with plants. Remember, lush means full of plant life. Roses in their last bloom, geraniums, hydrangeas, pansies with their skirts of bright colors. Jose could make out, scrolling down, the splash of a fountain. Then he heard the hysterical yapping of a poodle. From all his noise, a person might have thought the dog was on fire. Hi, Mr. Clemens, Arnie said, extending his hand. I'm Arnie Sanchez. It's nice to meet you again. Jose had never seen a kid actually greet someone like this. Mr. Clemens said, hiking up his pajama bottoms. I only wanted one kid to work. Oh, Arnie stuttered. Actually, my cousin Jose really does all the work, and I kind of, you know, supervise. Mr. Clemens pinched up his wrinkled face. He seemed not to understand. He took out a pea-sized hearing aid, fiddled with its tiny dial, and fit it into his ear, which was surrounded with wiry gray hair. I'm only paying for one boy, Mr. Clemens shouted. His poodle click-clicked and stood behind his legs. The dog bared its small, crooked teeth. That's right, Arnie said, smiling a strained smile. We know that you're going to, to compensate pay only one of us. Mr. Clemens muttered under his breath. He combed his hair with his fingers. He showed Jose the pool, which was shaped as round as an elephant. It was filthy with grime. Near the bottom, some grayish water shimmered and leaves floated as limp as cornflakes. It's got to be real clean, Mr. Clemens said, or it's not worth it. Oh, Jose's a great worker, Arnie said. He patted his cousin's shoulders and said that he could lift a mule. Mr. Clemens sized up Jose and squeezed his shoulders, too. How do I know you, anyhow? Mr. Clemens asked Arnie, who was aiming a smile at the poodle. You know my dad, Arnie answered, raising his smile to the old man. He works at Interstate Insurance. You and he had some business deal. Mr. Clemens thought for a moment, a hand on his mouth, head shaking. He could, have, he could have been thinking about the meaning of life. His face was so dark. Mexican fella? He inquired. That's him, Arnie said happily. Jose felt like hitting his cousin for his cheerful attitude. Instead, he walked over and picked up the white plastic bottle of bleach. Next to it were a wire brush, a pumice stone, and some rags. He set down the bottle and, like a surgeon, put on a pair of rubber gloves. You know what you're doing, boy? Mr. Clemens asked. Jose nodded as he walked into the pool. If it had been filled with water, his chest would have been wet. The new hair on his chest would have been floating like the legs of a jellyfish. I hope you guys are noticing some of the poetic language in this story. Gary Soto is better known as a poet, just like uh, Langston Hughes was better known as a poet. Um, so there's a lot of similes, metaphors, those kinds of things in this story. We're going to learn a lot more about those come November and December of this year. Let's finish this page. Oh yeah, Arnie chimed, speaking for his cousin. Jose was born to work. Jose would have drowned his cousin if there had been water. Instead, he poured a bleach solution into a rag and swirled it over an area. He took a wire brush and scrubbed. The black algae came up like a foamy monster. We're a team, Arnie said to Mr. Clemens. Arnie descended into the pool and took the bleach bottle from Jose. He held it for Jose and smiled up at Mr. Clemens, who, hands on his hips, watched it for a while, the poodle at his side. He cupped his ear as if to pick up the sounds of Jose's scrubbing. And lengthwise, I noticed that we are just past halfway through this story, so this is an awesome place to cut off um, this video to prepare for our next lesson. I'd like to remind you that at the end of our next lesson is our quiz. So again, review our vocab terms. We've seen most of them, either between uh, Thank You Ma'am from last week and uh, the first half of this story already. So I highly encourage you to review your vocab terms since there's no other assignment today. It's also not a bad idea to look through your grammar notes, so end marks, capitalization, and spelling once again. Look through those assignments too, just to make sure that you're prepared for the grammar section of our quiz too. I will show you individual questions on the quiz uh, in our lesson video in our next lesson.
So um, I will make sure that you're prepared to answer those types of questions, but reviewing your notes today is a good idea to start preparing for that one. Best of luck.